Tonight's presentation is titled Fresh Annual. Our presenter, Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation. He's author for numerous aviation publications. Mike holds certified flight instructor certificate, uh, A&P mechanic certificate, holds the inspection authorization privileges. 2008, he was FAA's Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year and a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much for being with us, continuing your wonderful series of information you bring to us on a monthly basis. I'm gonna turn control the presentation over to you. Uh, thanks, Tim. And uh, good. Um, well, tonight uh, I'm gonna tell you a story um, involving an aircraft owner who made some mistakes and learned some lessons. And uh, hopefully, you will profit from this uh, from this tale and uh, and and learn the same lessons without going through the same pain that this poor guy went through. Uh, it's a story about a fellow by the name of Dan. He's a 60-hour student pilot. Just purchased his first airplane. It was a 1974 Piper Warrior. Um, he bought the airplane in Texas and uh, flew it back to California with his uh, flight instructor. Um, and uh, he, he came to me uh, quite a bit later and told me this story. And he, and he said, you know, part of my deal with the previous owner was that he would have a complete annual inspection performed and any airworthiness discrepancies corrected um, before I took delivery. Um, the annual was completed uh, with no, no airworthiness discrepancies outstanding. It was completed in mid-February of this year and he flew it back from texas in early march with his flight instructor uh, dan went on to tell me he said the airplane seemed okay on the ferry flight to california except that the rate of climb was averaging only 300 to 500 feet per minute that sounds a little bit anemic he says i guess we really didn't notice it since all the airports we use had long runways but after getting back to my home field in california the the airport I fly out of has a 3,300 foot runway. And on takeoff, the airplane barely cleared the trees at the end of the runway. Um, so Dan went ahead and, and, and rented a Warrior uh, and I went and flew the rental Warrior and the rate of climb was much better than the airplane that he had just purchased. And he also, uh, was doing some book work and discovered that the uh, Warrior, which has a fixed pitch propeller, ha has a uh, maximum uh, or a minimum static RPM specification of 2,275 RPM is the minimum acceptable static RPM when you're running the engine at full power uh, on the ground with the, with the brake set. And he said, my Warrior can only make about 2,200 RPM when leaned for max RPM. So the engine was clearly uh, coming up short on static RPM uh, and not making full rated horsepower. Um, so Dan wanted to find out what was wrong with his airplane. He took his airplane um, that was freshly out of annual from Texas to uh, his local mechanic on his home field, asked the mechanic to take a look at the plane and try to find out why uh, the climb rate was so anemic and why it was failing to make static RPM. Um, the mechanic went through pretty complete inspection. He, he, he did compression check and found that the compressions uh, on were uh, on two of the, the four cylinders were under 60, which is the minimum acceptable compression uh, according to Lycoming. Uh, the other two were were in the low 60s. Um, there was leakage past the valves. Um, interestingly enough, the Texas mechanic who did the annual inspection a month prior had recorded in the logbooks that the compressions were um, mostly in the 70s and one in the high 60s. So, but the local mechanic got a very very different uh, reading. Uh, the mechanic did a bore scope inspection, which is the appropriate thing to do to find out the condition of the cylinders. And he said that um, all the cylinders had severely scored barrels. Uh, 
and there were obvious hot spots on the exhaust valves, which probably accounted for uh, the low compression with leakage past the exhaust valves. Um, he bled down the lifters and measured the dry tappet clearance and discovered that on at least several of the cylinders, there was a dry tappet clearance of about a quarter of an inch, which is much, much too large uh, and suggestive of a severely worn cam lobe. Of course, you couldn't really see the cam lobe without pulling cylinders off, but this is a good way of indirectly uh, checking the condition of the cam. And it looked like a couple of the cam lobes were probably in pretty serious trouble. Um, he checked the oil filter and the suction screen and found a ton of ferrous metal, nearly as a, a half a teaspoon of ferrous metal, which is a huge amount and is, um, uh, like Homing specifies that uh, a half a teaspoon of ferrous metal is, is, is grounds for tearing down the engine. Found some other things. Carburetor was leaking fuel. The ignition harness had some cracked B nuts on, on it where, the, where it attaches the spark plugs. Some trim cables were severely worn and frayed and uh, brake hoses were chafed all the way through the protective uh, metal braid. That's what some of the trim cables looked like. They were definitely coming apart. Yeah, here's one of the chafed brake hoses. It looked kind of bad. At any rate, the bottom line is that the airplane was grounded. Um, the engine needs to be torn down because it, at minimum it it has a bad cam and it's, it's full of ferrous metal. Um, so the engine was uh, pulled from the airplane, sent to an engine shop. The teardown confirmed what the mechanic had pretty much predicted based on the metal he saw in the uh, oil filter and screen and the and the, the uh, excessive tappet clearance that, that the engine internally was a train wreck. Several of the cam lobes were severely worn. Several lifters were, were spalled. Oil pump gears damaged. Uh, some of the bearings contaminated with metal. Here's a picture of um, one of the worn cam lobes where the, there's hardly a tow left on that lobe. Here, here are some of the spalled lifters out of that engine. Um, and on Lycoming engines, they use these um, uh, these mushroom style lifters where, that can't be removed without splitting the case because the uh, uh, the tappet that rides on the cam is, is larger than the barrel. So you can't pull these out from the outside. You can only get at them by splitting the case. So um, Dan did a little bit more investigation and uh, reported to me that the Texas shop that performed the annual inspection was the same shop that had maintained the airplane uh, exclusively for the past three and a half years. And it looked like the shop owner was quite friendly with the seller of the aircraft. Um, Dan said, I can't see how the plane could have possibly been found airworthy during an annual inspection with the engine full of metal and the compressions substandard and all of the things that the mechanic found, his mechanic found wrong with it. He said, uh, Dan quoted again, that these serious airworthiness issues should certainly have been caught during the annual. The plane should never have been allowed to fly. I feel like I have put my 12 year old son's life, my CFI's life and my own life in great danger going up in this airplane. And the bottom line he's asking me, is there any sort of liability on the part of the shop or the previous owner? Do I have any recourse against them? Basically, do I have a case? Well, I'm not a lawyer. And so I couldn't give Dan legal advice. Uh, but I've been through a lot of these, these uh, situations in the past. Um, my, my company manages hundreds of pre-buys every year. And so we deal with stuff like this all the time. And so um, I explained to Dan that, that typically in situations like this, uh, the buyer does not have any recourse against either the seller or the shop um, that perform the annual. Uh, the reason is that normally the sale of aircraft, which are, is typically based on a conditional purchase sale agreement that's signed by the buyer and seller. Um, 
it indicates that, that the aircraft is being sold as is uh, with no representation of airworthiness or any kind of a warranty by the seller. And it's the buyer that's totally responsible for determining if the aircraft is acceptable. And the way the buyer normally does that is by means of an independent pre-buy examination where the buyer hires a mechanic to inspect the aircraft. Um, and in this case, Dan didn't do that. Um, he, he, he relied on the seller's mechanic to do an annual rather than uh, having an independent pre-buy um, by a mechanic that he selected and that he hired. Uh, so under these circumstances, Dan would have recourse against the seller only if the seller either made a representation of airworthiness in the purchase sale agreement, which is very seldom the case. Normally purchase sale agreements uh, indicate that the aircraft is being sold as is and that the buyer is responsible for determining whether the aircraft is in acceptable condition, uh, or if the seller fraudulently misrepresented the aircraft somehow um, in, in his advertising or in some of the statements that he made to Dan. Um, and, and Dan had actually discussed the situation with the seller and he was pretty convinced in his own mind that the seller had no idea that this aircraft had these problems. Um, but basically it would be very difficult for Dan to have any legal recourse against the shop that performed this annual inspection or what you might call a pencil whipped annual inspection because it wasn't obviously much of an inspection. Um, and, and that's because the shop was hired by the previous owner and its duty was to the previous owner. The, the shop had no duty to Dan. Dan didn't hire the shop. Um, and in order to show negligence, the, the very first thing you have to show is that the the person that you're alleging to be have been negligent owes you a duty of care uh, and that they breached that duty and that the breach uh, caused damages to you and and that the the damages actually occurred and and this shop had no duty of care to Dan it only had a duty of care to the seller maybe the seller might have sued the shop but on the other hand, I don't see how the seller could show that he was damaged because he wound up selling the airplane to Dan for pretty close to his asking price. So uh, it, the seller probably couldn't couldn't proceed against the shop uh, uh, negligence uh, either because the, he couldn't show that he was damaged by the shop's actions. At any rate, um, th that was my sort of amateur uh conclusion uh, based on the situation, but just to be absolutely sure that I was uh, uh, giving Dan good advice, I, I checked with my own aviation attorney, uh, Doug Griffith, who's a great aviation attorney in Southern California and who my company keeps on retainer. I told him Dan's story and asked him what he thought. And um, Doug's rea first reaction was, wow, poor guy. And he says, you're right, litigation would likely go nowhere for the reasons you cite, even assuming a lawyer would find the case to be financially worthwhile in the first place, which is doubtful. In other words, it'd probably be hard for him to find a lawyer to take the case to, uh, to try to sue. Um, and Doug went on to say it, it could be exceedingly difficult to prove that the seller defrauded Dan. How could Dan prove that the seller knew of the problems with the aircraft? And in fact, as I said, Dan had talked to the seller and was pretty convinced in his own mind that the seller really didn't know that the aircraft had these problems. And as for the mechanic who inspected the aircraft, as I had told Dan, he had no duty to Dan. He only had a duty to the seller. At any rate, uh, this was not a good situation for Dan, but at my suggestion, um, uh, Dan contacted an AOPA pilot protection services pool attorney and also his own personal lawyer and um, a, a kind of a threatening lawyer letter alleging, alleging gross negligence was sent to the Texas shop that did the annual. Uh, now the shop probably could have blown this letter off 
and uh, Dan probably wouldn't have had any recourse. But this shop turns out to be a, a pretty good size shop that carried uh, um, adequate errors and, and omissions insurance. So they turned the lawyer letter over to their insurance company. Uh, the insurance company assigned an insurance adjuster and the insurance adjuster made Dan a $5,000 offer to settle the matter. Uh, of course, $5,000 wouldn't even have been a down payment on what it was going to cost Dan to put this airplane back in the air, probably close to $50,000, given everything that was wrong with the airplane. So Dan declined this this offer, and uh, the, the 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 last update I heard was that the the Dan's attorney and the shop's insurance adjuster were wrangling over a revised settlement amount. Um, so Dan will probably wind up getting something over that $5,000 offer, but probably nothing even close to what it's going to cost him to put this airplane uh, back in the air. So this was kind of a hard lesson for, uh, uh, for Dan, and it kind of illustrates something that I've been preaching for, for years and years, and that is that an annual inspection furnished by the seller is no substitute. Uh, for an independent pre-buy examination conducted by the buyer. Um, it's absolutely essential um, that that the buyer of an aircraft um, have an independent pre-buy uh, by a mechanic that he chooses, a mechanic that uh, has a duty strictly to him, to the, to the buyer. Um, as I mentioned, my company manages hundreds of pre-buys each year, and we, we, we've got some strict rules that we follow when we manage pre-buys. And, and one of the key rules is that the pre-buy examination must be performed by a shop or mechanic who has never seen the aircraft before and has no prior relationship with the seller, or if there's a broker involved, no prior relationship with the broker either. In other words, uh, the pre-buy has to be completely independent, and it has to be done by a mechanic whose allegiance is strictly to the buyer who is hiring him to do the pre-buy. To ensure such independence, we require that the seller um, in, in the purchase sale agreement authorize the prospective buyer to perform a pre-buy by any shop or mechanic of the buyer's choice within one hour flying time of the aircraft's home base. Um, it's, you know, sellers are unlikely to agree to let the airplane be flown half, halfway across the country for a pre-buy, of course, not knowing whether the the buyer is serious or not. Um, so as a, as, a, as a compromise that we think is fair to both sides, um, we ask that sellers um, agree to allow the airplane to be flown to a shop or a mechanic of the of the of the buyer's choice within one hour of flying time radius of the aircraft's home base. It seems like a reasonable compromise. And in almost any every case, we insist on actually having the aircraft flown somewhere other than its home airport for the pre-buy because. Um, it's likely that, that, that any mechanic on the home airport has had something to do with that aircraft in the past. Um, but, but of course, not an unreasonable distance away. So we think an hour's flying time is a, is a reasonable distance. Um, and this is to guarantee that the examination is performed outside of the seller's or broker's sphere of influence. Uh, we don't want the seller or his broker meddling in this pre-buy, we want it to be completely independent. Um, so there's typically a ferry flight involved moving the aircraft from its home base to where the pre-buy is gonna be done. And frequently this ferry flight uh, does double duty as a test flight uh, to ensure that the plane flies straight and performs uh, uh, to specifications and that all of the systems and avionics and autopilot and so on are, are, are working properly, things that are hard to test in the maintenance hangar, really have to be tested uh, in the air. Um, and so frequently we'll arrange to have a flight instructor uh, uh, perform this ferry flight and give him a checklist of things to check out uh, in the course of the flight um, 
in order to to make it into a into a test flight. Um, if the seller or the seller's brokers will not agree to these terms of allowing the pre-buy to be done um, at a shop of the buyer's choice within an hour's flying time away, we will advise our client to walk away from the deal. Um, because if, if the seller or the seller's broker is resisting having a truly independent pre-buy, then they probably have something to hide. Um, and we would generally recommend to our clients under those circumstances uh, to walk away and, and, and find another uh, purchase candidate from somebody who's a little bit more cooperative. So that's uh, that's Dan's story, and that's uh, the the lessons learned from Dan's story. And um, Tim, we can open things up for some Q and A if you'd like. All right, Mike, we got a couple of questions that have come in so far. Richard was wondering how many hours were on the engine in Dan's aircraft, and are these types of wearing typical? Um, I don't know how many hours were were, were on the engine. Um, uh, the, the cam and lifter spalling that that, that engine uh, uh, experienced is not uncommon, especially in Lycomings, which tend to have more cam and lifter problems uh, than Continentals. Continentals tend to have more more cylinder problems. Lycomings have more cam and lifter problems, and the reason for that is that Lycomings have a high mounted cam, um, where which is it's the first thing that the that the oil strips off if the airplane is inactive, and typically uh, cam and lifter problems like this are, are found in in airplanes that have uh, undergone um, some prolonged period of disuse, um, and frequently uh, in in an area of of high corrosion risk. And um, uh, South Texas is an area of high corrosion risk because um, near the Gulf. And I don't, because we didn't do a pre-buy on this thing, we, we found out, I found out about this story after, after the damage was done. Um, I don't, I didn't really get into the history of the aircraft, but if I was a betting man, I would bet that this airplane had, had a history of inactivity. Um, and uh, that's typically what causes the uh, cam and lifters to come apart is is that the uh, the, the engine is inactive and um, subject to corrosive attack and you get uh, corrosion pitting and then when the engine starts running again those pits get uh, mechanically enlarged and and cause a spalling and and uh, uh, excessive wear and once the the cam is is built uh, of uh, carburized steel. It's it's case hardened through a process called carburizing, and that that really hard outer layer of the cam is about fifteen thousandths thick. And once you wear through that fifteen thousandths layer uh, and get into the soft inner meat of the cam, uh, the wear uh, goes up. The wear rate goes up exponentially, and and the cam lobes flatten out pretty quickly. Once you've gotten through that 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 hardened layer, but typically it's a corrosion related thing. Um, but also it it does seem apparent that that uh, this aircraft has had negligent maintenance because these things don't happen overnight and they should have been caught a whole lot earlier. Um, so I suspect that. Uh, this last annual wasn't the only pencil whipped annual that was done on this aircraft, but that's just my my suspicion based on some experience. I I, I don't know that much about the, the the detailed history because we did not have the opportunity to do a pre buy on this aircraft. Obviously, we uh, I found out about Dan's story after the after the fact. Mark is wondering, can the buyer with evidence in hand report the shop to the local FISDO for appropriate action? Um, well, certainly, uh, but that's not going to remedy the buyer situation. Um, frankly, the, the, um, 
I mean, if, if, if you just want to be spiteful and get the shop in trouble, the, this Texas shop that you'll probably never have any dealings with again, um, then sure, you could you could report him to the FISDO and make a fuss and m maybe something would happen. But I think the, the better course of action is to use the threat that you might report them to the FAA to try to get some money out of them, which is really, really what the, this, this poor buyer wants. And, and I suspect the fact that they turned it over to their insurance company and their insurance company was willing to talk about a settlement, even though legally they really had no duty of care to, to, uh, to Dan, was probably because they wanted to make Dan happy enough that he wasn't going to go to the FAA and, and, and rat him out. So, you know, it seems to me that, that, that the threat of, of reporting to the FAA is more useful in a situation like this than actually doing it. But that's just me. Let's see here. Stephen is wondering, uh, should the buyer attend this pre-buy inspection? Would it serve as an opportunity to learn about the airplane? Well, um, of course, there really wasn't a pre-buy uh, inspection or I, what I call pre-buy examination. Uh, this was an annual. It was it was done by the by the buyer. Um, the the seller, I mean, but done by the seller. The, rather than have the buyer attend the annual he he should have not relied on it on an annual to be uh to serve as his his uh, pre-buy and this is a mistake that's made a lot i mean you hear uh, i've heard thousands of times people say well the best pre-buy is an annual inspection and, and i violently disagree with that the, the objectives of an annual and the objectives of a pre-buy are totally different. And the most important thing is, is who pays for it and who controls it. And the, the, the most important part about the, a pre-buy is that it should be strictly controlled um, by the buyer because it's for the benefit of the buyer. It's, it's to help the buyer decide whether or not to buy the airplane. And if problems are found with the airplane, uh, what problems um, rise to the level of airworthiness issues that the seller should be asked to pay for? You, you strike a deal with a with a seller of a, of a of a given price, but that price is 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 based on the assumption that the that the airplane is airworthy. A buyer is not entitled to a perfect airplane. If you wanted a perfect airplane, you should go buy a new one. But what he is entitled to is an airworthy air, airplane. And so the general rule is that um, you, you do a pre-buy, you find a bunch of discrepancies. Some of them are cosmetic discrepancies, and, and those are ones that the buyer should be responsible for. And some of them may be airworthiness discrepancies, and airworthiness discrepancies are things that the seller should be responsible for. Again, on the basis that what the buyer is entitled to come out of this with is an airworthy airplane. So that's that's generally the the ground rules uh, of, of one of these transactions. And one of the things that we do, one of the more important things that we do when we manage uh, a pre-buy for, for a client is to interpret the results of the pre-buy examination and make recommendations as to which discrepancies should be the buyer's responsibility and which discrepancies should be the seller's responsibility. Um, and that's that's you know the one of the two reasons that you do a pre-buy the first is to decide whether you want to buy the airplane or walk away from it and the second is to determine what corrective action should uh, that should the uh, the seller should be asked to uh, to pay for and um, if you're doing it on the basis of an annual that the that the seller uh, paid for you you don't you don't have either of those things really. Several people are wondering what's the typical cost of a pre-buy inspection and who generally pays for the pre-buy, the buyer or seller? Well, for the, the, I'll answer the second part first. 
the buyer has to pay for the pre-buy, otherwise it's meaningless. The, 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 the pre-buy should be, it is solely for the benefit of the buyer. And um, it, it needs to be completely controlled by the buyer and it needs to be done by somebody who has no allegiance to the seller, whose allegiance is strictly to, to the buyer and has only the buyer's best interests at, at heart. The question about what what a pre-buy costs is um, more complicated. It obviously it depends on a whole lot of things. It depends on what kind of airplanes involved, how complex it is, um, how deep the the, the pre-buy needs to go, um, and uh, where in the country it, it's it's done because shop rates vary quite a bit from. You know, the shop rates in New York City area are a whole lot higher than the shop rates in Texas. So it it, it depends on a lot of things. But just to, you know, to, to give a, a, some sort of a ballpark number to to that answer, um, we, do, we do a lot of pre-buys of, of Cirruses, for example, uh, which is a, you know, high-performance single-engine aircraft. Um, we generally figure on a pre-buy for a normally aspirated Cirrus as being about eight hour, hours of labor and uh, for a turbocharged uh, Cirrus about 10 hours of labor. Obviously for a twin it would be a whole lot more than that. For a 172 it would be less than that. Um, and and that's, that's purely the labor component. Uh, we, we also, of course, when we manage a pre-buy, we, we, we charge a, a management fee, you know, the, which is on top of that. But that gives you some sort of general idea. So, you know, if, if the shop rate is 100 bucks an hour, which is, it would be higher than that in New York, probably lower than that in Texas. But if it was $100 an hour and it was a, you know, a 10-hour inspection, you're talking about maybe $1,000. They give, give you a general ballpark. Um, but you know, this guy didn't do the thousand dollar pre-buy and is going to wind up paying fifty thousand dollars to make the airplane airworthy. And this is just a warrior. This is like a, a simple airplane. Imagine if this had happened with a, you know, with a with a Bonanza or a, a twin Cessna or something. That it, it, it could have been, you know, really catastrophic. Um, so it's it's just the the money you spend on a pre-buy is always money very well spent. John wonders what's a common outcome when a pre-buy finds an item that deems the aircraft unairworthy. Do seller and buyers share the cost or what? Well, no. As I, as I said, the normal rule is that the seller should be responsible for correcting any airworthiness discrepancies that are found in the pre-buy, and the buyer should be responsible for correcting any discrepancies that don't rise to the level of being an airworthiness issue. And when I when I talk about an airworthiness discrepancy, I'm talking about a discrepancy that is sufficiently severe that 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 had it been discovered during an annual inspection, um, the inspector would have not been able to sign off the annual as airworthy uh, unless that discrepancy was corrected. Um, but you know, the, typically when you inspect an airplane, you find lots of discrepancies, but only a few of them tend to or, or rise to the level of being airworthiness discrepancies, and and those are the ones that the seller should be responsible for. Ray is wondering, are there often checklists that are type specific for pre-buys and what sorts of things are typically checked? Yes, there absolutely are. And, and that's very important because, you know, if, if you're talking about say an annual inspection, there's, there's actually, an FAA definition of what needs to be in an annual inspection at, at minimum. There's, you know, part 43 appendix D says what, what at minimum you have to do in an annual. Um, there's no 
regulatory definition of what a pre-buy should entail. A pre-buy can can be whatever the seller wants it. To, I mean, the buyer wants it to be, and whatever the buyer is willing to pay for it to be. Um, now we we have pretty strong feelings about what should be included in in a pre-buy, and there are a lot of things that you would do in an annual that we wouldn't waste our time doing in a pre-buy. And there are some things that you would never do in an annual that, that we frequently do in a pre-buy. I'll give you some examples, but, but let, let me just talk about the goals here. The goal of an annual inspection is to determine if the airplane is airworthy. That's not what we're interested in in a pre-buy. In a pre-buy, we're interested in finding the big showstopper things that would either cause the, the buyer to walk away from the deal or cause the buyer to renegotiate the price with the, with the seller. So let's say, for example, uh, some of the control cables or are, are their, their tension is not up to spec. Um, that's something that you have to check in an annual, but we wouldn't we wouldn't bother to check that in a pre-buy because it's it's a low ticket item and and, and I mean there's no point in getting involved in in, a, in nickel and dime issues when you're buying an airplane. You're not going to walk away from an airplane because of a you know something that costs fifty bucks to fix. We're, we're interested in you know the the five thousand dollar things. <laughs> Uh, when we're doing a, a pre-buy. Um, on the other hand, um, if, for example, we're doing a pre-buy on a Cirrus and we know from reviewing the logbooks that that Cirrus has um, had some extended periods of disuse and it was based in Houston, Texas, we know that the cam and lifters are at risk. So we may specify that we want some lifters pulled and inspected uh, during the pre-buy, and we want to inspect the cam uh, by putting a bore scope in the vacant lifter bores. This is something, by the way, you can't do with Lycomings because it's they, they've got these mushroom lifters that can't come out from the outside. But on Continentals, we can pull lifters, we can look at the lifters, we can look at the cam. That's not something you would ever do during an annual. During, because, uh, during an annual inspection, we, we don't do stuff like that. The, the, if a cam and lifter are coming apart, the way we normally find out is there's metal in the filter. Um, but in the case of a pre-buy, um, finding a, a cam and lifter problem at the pre-buy is the difference between the buyer and the seller having to pay for a $50,000 engine teardown. So, um, it's, it's, so it's really important to do it in a, in a pre-buy, although it's something you would never do in an annual inspection because it's, it's not a safety issue. It's, not, it's, it's, only, it's, it's like what I say is it's not a safety of flight issue. It's only a safety of wallet issue. So it, it, it's not important to catch it in, in an annual because nobody's going to fall out of the sky because a cam and lifter is falling. But it is very important to find it, to find it during a pre-buy. So that's, that's why I say that there are lots of things that you would do in an annual that we wouldn't bother to do in a pre-buy. And there are some things that you would never do in an annual that, that we often do during a pre-buy because the goals of the pre-buy and the goals of the annual are, are very, very different. So that was kind of a very long-winded answer. I hope it answered the question. Uh, that was a great answer. Yes, thank you. Uh, Fred is wondering, do you know if all ADs had been satisfied and complied with in Dan's case? And I assume the pre-buy inspection would also check AD compliance? The the, the pre-buy inspection definitely, if there were, had been one, would have definitely checked AD compliance. The annual was required by regulation to check AD compliance, but the evidence seems to be that the annual was pretty much pencil whip so who knows what whether ad compliance was checked or whether it was checked diligently by this shop um no idea um what, what whether all ad's were complied with 
none of the things that were found to be wrong were, were AD related. But, um, but again, if, if, if Dan had paid for a pre-buy, one of the things that would have been done in the pre-buy is, is, is an exhaustive AD search. Um, but he relied on, on the seller's mechanic to do an annual. And who, who knows whether the seller's mechanic did a competent job of researching ADs. It certainly didn't do a competent job of anything else. So I, I would be a little dubious about that. Thomas is wondering, would an oil analysis have indicated the problems? Probably not. Um, I mean, I can't tell you what the oil analysis would have shown, but generally speaking, when cam and lifter stuff comes apart, we don't see it in oil analysis. And, and the reason is that um, when cam and lifters come apart, they come apart pretty rapidly and they, they throw off pretty good sized pieces of metal. Um, and I showed you a picture of a bunch of that metal adhered to a magnet. Well, that metal is going to be either caught in the suction screen or caught in the oil filter, and it's never going to wind up in the sample jar. So that's why we very rarely will see evidence of cam and lifter spalling in oil analysis. Oil analysis um, only sees microscopic uh, wear metal particles that, that generally are thrown off by very slow wear events. So if if we have, for example, accelerated wear of, uh, of of an exhaust valve guide um, that's going to show up in oil analysis as, as as high nickel because the the exhaust valve guide is made of very hard material the exhaust valve stem is chromed and it's very hard so the wear rate is very slow and the wear particles that are thrown off are very very tiny and they are tiny enough that they would pass through the oil filter and and be suspended in the oil and be analyzed when the sample goes to the lab. But anything that throws off pretty good sized pieces of metal, say, you know, 100 microns or, or, or bigger, um, those are always going to be caught in the oil filter and they're never going to wind up in the sample jar. So you wouldn't expect oil analysis uh, to, to, to show those things. Again, I don't think an oil analysis was done, um, but I'm not sure it would have been particularly dispositive had it been done. John is wondering, do the buyer and seller have to agree how invasive the pre-buy will be? Um, well, that's that's a good question. Uh, our policy is that um, if we're going to do something in excess of what would be expected in an annual, for example, pulling lifters, we will ask the seller's permission to do that. And we'll indicate that that we believe it's required because the airplane had a history of disuse and uh, uh, we, we won't just pull the lifters without without asking the, the, uh, the seller's permission. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, w they agree to, to to let us do that because it's only slightly invasive. But for example, we would never uh, ask that a cylinder be pulled or something truly invasive uh, in in a pre-buy. If 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 we felt that the cylinder had to come off, we would just say let's pass on the airplane because that's just an unreasonable thing uh, to to expect a seller to agree to. John's wondering. Um legal liability issue. What about liability on the pre-buy inspector who misses a major flaw in the aircraft? Well, I mean, that's that that's arguable. You, we're, we're assuming that a pre-buy was actually done and, and uh, something serious was missed. Um, you know, there, there's no reasonable expectation that an inspection will catch everything. Uh, inspections never catch everything. That's why we do them every year, and we always are finding new stuff. And I, you know, I I know, you know, ten years after I bought my Cessna 310, and I was very deeply involved in the in the maintenance of it. Of course, uh, we were still finding things that obviously were were wrong from the factory. <laughs> 
and it took us 10 years to to find that discrepancy and, and i was the second owner of the airplane it had been owned for eight years before that by somebody else and went through eight more annuals so inspections don't catch everything and and it's not reasonable to expect that they will catch everything if you know if you hire a mechanic to do a pre-buy he misses something that causes you great expense um, you could try to hire a lawyer to to sue him most mechanics aren't worth suing because they they don't have very much net worth uh if the mechanic if the only if the pre-buy was done in a pretty large shop that carries e and o insurance uh, would it even be plausible to 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 try to bring a case where, where there was insurance to back it up um but again it would be a difficult a difficult case to prove negligence because all a mechanic has to prove is 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 that he followed a checklist that you gave him um and, and if he can show that he followed that checklist he's pretty much in the clear um we don't ever expect that everything is going to be found in any inspection uh and a pre-buy is typically a significantly um shorter uh inspection than an annual is so um, um you could you could try to make a case but i but the chances are it wouldn't go very far hmm. mike's wondering uh can a pre-buy inspector be flown to the airport where the aircraft is for sale to do a pre-buy instead of ferrying the aircraft yes and that sometimes happens but it's definitely not optimal first of all mechanics hate working in remote locations where they don't have access to their toolbox and 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 all jacks and all the stuff that they are used to 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 doing um they, they if, if the if the mechanic has flown to is take goes to the airplane they have to find some suitable venue to do the inspection that usually would be a, some shop on the field shops on the field don't particularly like mechanics from the outside to be coming in and using their facilities and tools it's just not a good situation so uh it, we we generally find it a whole lot easier let even if the airplane's out of annual we, we find it easier to get a ferry permit to move the airplane to where the pre-buy is going to be done than 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 to move the pre-buy mechanic to where the airplane is it's just mechanics just don't like to like to work away from their their mm -hmm. comfort zone tom's wondering if the airplane um um uh, I'm sorry, is the airplane grounded if found to be unairworthy during the pre-buy? If yes, what are the responsibilities of the buyer and seller typically at that point, especially if the buyer balks at making the purchase? Who pays for getting the plane back to the seller? Well, that's a terrific question, and I'm really glad you asked that because that's a really, really important point. Um, we are, are always extremely careful when we uh, manage pre-buys to make sure that the pre-buy is not structured as an inspection. I mentioned to you, I never call it a pre-buy inspection. I always call it a pre-buy examination. And the reason is that inspection is, is a regulatory term. Um, we make sure that the, that the pre-buy examination is never structured as an inspection. It does not, there's never an, a log book entry made other than maybe if the oil filter was removed or something that that that's long but uh the fact that the that somebody looked at that airplane it, it is treated as a non maintenance event it is not logged the results of of the examination are disclosed uh, to to the the buyer who who paid for it but but they're never recorded anywhere uh it is so it would be totally unfair to the seller to have the airplane taken to a mechanic that the seller had no no you know no choice in at a location that the seller had no choice in and then find the airplane grounded there and so we are very careful 
that 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 pre-buys are never structured as inspections. They are never treated as as regulatory airworthiness determinations. I'm trying to pick my words carefully here, um, because we never want to be in a situation where no matter what is found during the pre-buy, uh, that the aircraft is uh, is is declared to be unairworthy. In, in any way that is recorded anywhere. If we find something really dangerous, we'll tell the seller about it. But you, you know, the, the rule is, and, and I'm getting, I'll be getting slightly off topic here, but what the regulations require is that the pilot in command is the person who makes the determination as to whether the aircraft is airworthy. And there's only one exception to that, and it happens once a year. And once a year, you're required to hire an IA to make an airworthiness determination. But 364 days of the year, it's the pilot in command that makes the airworthiness determination. So um, the pre-buy is made on one of those 364 days. <laughs> And, uh, it, and 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 whoever it, that mechanic who's looking at that airplane is not doing an inspection. He's doing a look-see. He's telling the buyer what he thinks, what he found, but but he's not making an error with his determination. And, and the determination of whether that airplane should be flown home uh, is up to the pilot in command, uh, just like it is every day. Um, as far as the cost is concerned, um, the the buyer is responsible for moving the airplane to the pre-buy location and moving it back home, um, unless he buys the airplane, and then we generally recommend that he not move it back home um, and that he take delivery at the at the pre-buy location. But it is it be, because the pre-buy is being done for the benefit of the buyer. Um, it, it's agreed to up front that the buyer is responsible for the cost of moving the airplane both both directions. Edward's wondering if the pilot is hired to fly the aircraft an hour away, whose insurance is responsible for an accident or incident while flying it? Well, I mean, it, it would be the it would be the, the the owner's insurance, the seller, um, and and the the if if the ferry flight were were done without the uh, i mean s some sellers want to ferry the airplane themselves uh but if we hire a flight instructor to do it the flight instructor would just have to meet the uh, the open pilot warranty provisions of of the uh, of the owner's insurance and and typically every insurance policy has named pilots and also what's called an open pilot warranty that says uh, the insurance will cover um, any pilot that meets the following criteria. And usually it's you know 500 hours total time and 50 hours in type or something like that. It, 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 there's there's just some requirements in the insurance policy that that the ferry pilot would have to meet in order to to be covered. Charles uh, is asking, when you manage a pre-buy, your company, do you recommend the A&P within the hour flight time? I I sort of missed the last part of that question. I don't I don't know what the hour flight time means, but oh, I, I'd say that within the one hour flight time radius. Okay, yes, we 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 normally are are the ones that 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 choose the shop and make the arrangements uh, for the pre-buy, yes. And Mike's wondering what happens um, if the buyer's shop messes up while working on the plane, damages something, who's responsible? Well, we've never had that happen, but if the, if the shop that was working on the plane damages it, obviously the shop is, is responsible for it. And, and we tend to only, do business with with fairly large shops that that do carry adequate insurance so that that the you know if they make an error it's covered by their insurance 
Albert uh, says, Mike mentioned in other webinars, the pre-buy examination can be converted, quote unquote, to an annual by the buyer after the purchase. How is this yes. done? Yeah, we do that quite a lot. Um, it, 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 at the completion of the pre-buy, we, we ask the pre-buy shop to not close up the airplane, to, to, to leave it opened up with all the inspection plates and cowlings and stuff off uh, until the buyer and seller can finalize the deal assuming that the uh, assuming that the the buyer decides not to walk away um and uh once the deal has been finalized and title has been transferred to the buyer it it depending on how soon the annual inspection comes due it's it's often advantageous to convert that pre-buy into an annual by completing the, i mean the airplane's already opened up a lot of the work that would be done in an annual has already been done like the ad research and 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 quite a lot of the inspection uh, most of i mean we for example during the pre-buy we there's a big uh, concentration on, on on the engine, and we typically do pretty much everything that you would do in an annual uh, uh, on the power plant. Um, so it's it's often advantageous to just say, okay, do what the, the the rest of the stuff to to turn it into an annual and sign it off as an annual inspection. But you you can't do that until title is transferred to the uh, you know, from from the seller to the buyer. Another thing we 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 always have problems uh, con convincing our clients about is is when when a when when a buyer gets to the point of wanting to of, of signing a contract with the seller and 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 arranging for a pre buy, uh, they almost always in their mind have, have already bought the airplane. And, and they, they they think it's theirs. Of course, it's not theirs yet. And uh, so one of the things they often do is say, well, gee, while you're doing this pre-buy, could, could you, you know, install some extra headphone jacks for my Bose headset? And could you do this? And could you do that to the airplane? And we say, no, you can't do that. It's not your airplane. You know, you, you, you can't be making repairs or alterations or, or uh, to, to an airplane that you don't own. You have to wait until it's yours before you do that sort of thing. So we're constantly restraining our clients from uh, from, from making improvements to this airplane that's in the middle of a pre-buy um, because you, it's really not cricket to, to do anything to that airplane un, until you actually own it. Um, but once title transfers, again, uh, that it's very common to say, well, it's in the pre-buy shop, it's all opened up, um, before you put it back together, would you do this, this, and, and this, that, that, you know, install this or modify this or, or, or whatever. And that's perfectly fine once uh, the deal has been done and the title has transferred from seller to buyer. Drew is wondering, how many buyers go through more than one pre-buy? What's the record number? Oh, you mean with, with with different airplanes? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's pretty it's it's pretty common to 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 wind up not buying the very first airplane you do a pre buy on. Um, I, you know, I would say certainly well over half of the pre buys that we start wind up in a, in a successful sale, and the newer the airplane the more likely it is for the sale to go through so if we're doing a pre-buy on a cirrus it's probably 90 percent that 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 pre-buy is going to wind up in a sale if we're doing a pre-buy on a, a 1968 cessna 182 you know it might be closer to 50 50. and the reason is simply because older airplanes tend to have more surprises <laughs> When you when when you're doing the pre-buy, um, but uh, so so it 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 varies. Uh, I know we've had people who've who've done you know like three pre-buys before they finally buy the airplane that 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 they want. 
Um, and sometimes it's because the airplane has a nasty surprise. And sometimes it's because the, you know, the seller turns out to be uncooperative and is unwilling to pay for things that he should pay for and things like that. So there are various reasons that that the sales fall apart and that the uh, that the buyer goes on to another purchase candidate. We try really hard to convince our clients not to let uh, good airplanes get away for silly reasons. Uh, I remember that we had I had one client who was buying a Cessna 421C, which is a like a six hundred seven hundred thousand dollar purchase of a of a cabin class piston twin, and and, and he he got into a argument over one soft cylinder uh, that that he wanted replaced and the seller didn't want to replace it and he was about to walk away from the deal and I I I said I said this this cylinder replacement represents maybe one percent of the price of the airplane and this is a very nice airplane are you really going to walk away from the deal uh, because of a, a cylinder change that's one percent of the of, of the purchase price and he, he thought about it again he decided not he decided he was going to go ahead and buy the airplane replace the cylinder himself but um you know it's uh, th these things tend to be pretty emotional events and sometimes people do things that that don't don't make sense we try very hard to to give them a big picture and to keep them on on track mike just comments she says this is similar to a home inspection prior to a home sale it is very similar yeah, absolutely. Except that typically we don't do a termite inspection of airplanes, but I guess there are airplanes maybe, where you might want to do that. Maybe Belancas, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a funny termite story on a Belanca, but I'm not going to tell it. <laughs> I know you used to own one, didn't you? I, I did, but yeah. unfortunately it wasn't mine that had the termites. But uh, Ooh, That's good. <laughs> um, hey, Frank is wondering, what is required to obtain a ferry permit for an out-of-annual airplane to the um, pre-buy location? Uh, what is required, it's, it's, it's very, very simple. You, you, you fill out a form, um, FAA 8130-6 uh, form. Uh, requesting the ferry permit, you expl explain that you want the ferry permit because the airplane's out of annual and you want to ferry it to a place where the inspection can be done. You um, will have to certify that um, uh, that all um, outstanding airworthiness directives have been complied with. Uh, they typically don't like to issue ferry permits on airplanes that have outstanding ADs. Um, and you and you you'll need you need to get an A and P to sign a logbook entry saying that the airplane is is safe to ferry, and typically you email or fax all this stuff to the FISDO, and within a day they fax you back your ferry permit. Um, it's it's usually a very simple process. Uh, Colleen is just wondering, would you expect to do a gear swing on a pre-buy on a retractable aircraft? Oh, sure. Absolutely. And Ken is wondering, is the complete logbook analysis done before the plane is flown to the pre-buy shop so that it can uh, be eliminating if the logs um, are a problem? What we do at Savvy, we, we, we do two reviews of the logbooks. We do a preliminary review um, of the logbooks just to ensure that the airplane looks like a good purchase candidate and that there aren't any obvious red flags or showstoppers in the logbooks. Um, and then only if those logbooks pass muster Will we recommend that the that the owner go ahead and 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 start the pre-buy, and then during the pre-buy there's a more formal uh, logbook review in which there's a, a complete AD search done and so on. Um, but the, we we like I say we do a preliminary logbook review uh, where we we just go through the logbooks and uh, we we want to get an idea of whether there are any big gaps in there that either missing records or uh, 
evidence of long periods of time when the airplane wasn't flown. We want to get an idea of who's been maintaining the airplane and what quality of maintenance it's been getting. And you can tell an awful lot by scanning through the logbook. So that's the kind of thing we do during the preliminary review. And frequently clients will come to us with two or three purchase candidates that they found online. And we'll do a preliminary logbook review on, on each of the three aircraft and then recommend which of the three they should make an offer on. Um, but the formal review is is done once the pre-buy is started. A couple of questions about experimental amateur built aircraft. John is wondering, um, does a pre-buy on an experimental amateur built aircraft differ from a type certificated aircraft? Well, we haven't done a, a, a lot of experimental aircraft. Um, the you know, most of the experimental aircraft that that we deal with are ones that have certificated engines, typically certificated wheels and brakes, uh, a lot of certificated components. Even though the aircraft itself is 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 uh, is uh, is an EAB, and uh, as I mentioned, a, a big part of the a big emphasis on the pre-buy is is the power plant um, because that's the that's the most likely place to find a big ticket uh, discrepancy that could you know make a big difference as to whether the 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 sale goes through um, and so if the airplane the experimental airplane has a certificated power plant we would go through the same stuff that we would go through whether if it was certificated um the other big ticket thing tends to be corrosion issues if it's a metal airplane um, and we would do the same sort of corrosion inspection but if it was an rv as we would if it was a you know a 182. so i i think they're, they're pretty pretty similar really Thomas was just wondering, do you have a way to find AMPs for um, any specific experimental amateur built aircraft? Um, I, I can't really answer that question. As I said, we, we don't do a lot of experimentals in, in, in Savvy's practice. We're, we're starting slowly to do more and more of them, um, but, uh, but I, I, I really don't have a basis to, to answer the question. Eric wonders, what's the worst thing you found on a pre-buy? Oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> we found a lot of a lot of pretty worse things. Um, I, I I I wrote a an article. I'm trying to remember. I think it was I think it was published in EA Sport Aviation, as a matter of fact, and it was called. I think the title of it was the case of the SCSI Skyhawk. <laughs> and, and it basically talked about a Skyhawk that we were asked to do a pre-buy on where every place we looked, it was like a train wreck. You know, the, mm. the it was just, everything was wrong with it. It was in just horrible disrepair. And we recommended that the owner, that the, that the, the, the prospective buyer walk away from it. Um, um, Bud just wonders how detrimental are missing <laughs> logs? if the aircraft appears to be in good condition otherwise after the pre-buy? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, the, the From a regulatory standpoint, um, most things that go into logbooks, um, things that are called 43.9 and 43.11 entries, 43.11 entries are, are, are records of inspections and 43.9 entries are records of everything else repairs and uh, alterations and preventive maintenance and so on and, and all of those logbook entries um, the, the FAA only requires keeping them from for one year so the fact that they're missing for example record of uh, three annuals ago if, if it disappears it typically has no regulatory significance um, th does it have a significance in the airplane's fair market value? Usually it does. People tend to value airplanes less if they've, if they've got missing logbooks. The, the time that missing uh, 
records become a sticky wicket is if you are missing one of the things that the FAA requires that you keep indefinitely. And the, 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 the biggest item of that category is records of airworthiness directive compliance. If you, if you have missing logbooks such that you cannot substantiate that certain ADs were complied with, you may have to comply with them over again. Um, so that's that's really the biggest downside risk of, of, of missing logbooks. So, you know, sort of the bottom line is uh, missing logbooks tend to devalue the, the, the fair market value of the airplane uh, simply because people, you know, prefer uh, an airplane with, with complete records. But from a regulatory standpoint, uh, the, the only big problem with missing logbooks is if you um, if if you can't if if you're unable to substantiate uh, compliance with with certain airworthiness directives, which might have to get recomplied with if you can't prove that they they were complied with in the in the first place. Uh, the other problem, which is typically not a huge problem uh, for Part 91 operators is that sometimes if you if you if if you're missing certain logbook records you may not be able to substantiate the amount of time say on an engine or a propeller um, so you don't really know how far to tbo it is now for part 91 operators that's not really important because we're not required to comply with tbo we can totally ignore tbo um, but if if the airplane was going to be used for uh, commercial operations, Part 135 or something, where uh, TBO compliance it becomes an important issue, uh, then losing records of the of, of those component times could be a problem. So you know the bottom line answer is it kind of depends on what's missing. Uh, some things that are missing are not consequential. Other things that are missing can be a problem. Hmm. Well, Mike, this has been an excellent Q&A session and uh, everybody sure did come up with a lot of great questions. I think we've been through about the, you know, context of, of all of them. So let's wrap it up here. Take a moment, share your closing thoughts with everybody. Okay. Um, well, just very quickly, uh, um, my my four books are still available on Amazon. If uh, those of you who have, um, have have read them, I would really appreciate it if you would take a moment to go onto Amazon and post reviews. Our um, newsletter, uh, if you're not on our newsletter list, you can get on by going to SavvyAviation.com and there's a box or there's a button up at the top of the screen that lets you put yourself on the mailing list. Or I think you can also, if you stick around for the post webinar um, survey that Tim's going to put up, there's a checkbox you can check. Um, it's actually more than a free monthly newsletter list now uh, because we're we've been sending out um, weekly uh, true life stories of things that have happened to aircraft owners, and it's it's uh, it's some pretty interesting stuff that we're sending out to that list. So um, I would. Uh, encourage anybody who's not on our mailing list to to add themselves that way. Uh, I am um, converting my four books into audio books. The manifesto is almost done. I've got, I think, two more chapters, and it will become uh, the first uh, of my audio books available on Audible. Um, and I'll I'll announce here uh, when when that's done and available. Um, uh, upcoming webinars uh, in October, November, December, as usual, it's the first Wednesday of each month. In October, we'll be talking about the mechanic shortage that that, that I see coming. Um, in November, the webinar is called Your Engine's Lifeblood. It's going to be about oil and oil additives and things like that. And December 2nd, uh, the webinar is entitled Good Eyes, Great Catch. And it'll be talking about the importance of uh, of an experienced set of mechanics eyes in in in, in finding elusive problems. And finally, this is the last time I'm going to get to talk about this. Uh, 
uh, we've had this sort of amazing deal going where our breakdown assistance has been uh, offered for free uh, during the COVID-19 lockdown. And we are officially ending that uh, on September 8th, the day after Labor Day. And um, uh, if you sign up for the free breakdown service and you have a few more days to do it, if you, if you haven't done so already, uh, you will be getting kind of an amazing offer to be able to extend it on a paid basis, but at a very, very deep discount from what we normally charge. So I did want to mention that because that's going to expire in six more days. Um, and uh, we'll make you an offer you can't refuse if you sign up for this for the free service now. And that's all I have, Tim, until next month. Well, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, this has been a very interesting presentation and Q&A session. And uh, sure to appreciate your offer extended to our community for your breakdown service uh, free. What a what an offer. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. It looks like we had um, over 900, Mike. I don't want to say 950, but probably 925 is what we were looking at. Okay, well, we're looking to we're looking to break a thousand now that the thousand limit has been taken away. So um, I'll, I'll I'll have to come up with a with a really racy webinar title. Maybe we'll get over a thousand. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. We'll talk to you next month. Okay. See everybody next month. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.